Buenos días y muchas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Un saludo especial también a todos los que nos estáis siguiendo por streaming. Este, este segundo y último panel de la mañana es el que denominamos siempre el panel de negocio, donde intentaremos eh, digamos, eh, bajar a la realidad y al impacto sobre nuestra actividad común, la, la financiación eh, de la internacionalización de las empresas, todas aquellas... Eh, todos esos puntos de vista y esas predicciones que hemos escuchado eh, tanto de Martin Wolf como del, del panel anterior. Eh, tenemos invitados que vienen desde Francia y desde Italia y que han, han tenido la amabilidad de acompañarnos, por lo que esta parte de la conferencia continuará en inglés. Sabéis que hay traducción simultánea con auriculares en todos los sitios para los que necesitéis. Y también os invitamos a utilizar la aplicación Slido. Eh, podéis descargar en los móviles e ir cargando preguntas que intentaremos responder al final de la sesión. Eh, muchos me conocéis, para aquellos que no lo, lo hagáis todavía. Soy Carmen Vara, soy directora de operaciones de la cuenta de, de, del Estado de CESTE. So, welcome to this uh, second panel of the day. Uh, as we heard before, we, we find ourselves at a time where our companies, active in international um, trade, finance, fin trade and finance, face very important challenges. And they need to operate in a context that affects um, their competitiveness, and, and both companies need to devise strategies to, to move in this world, ECA strategies to help them do so, and banks to also accompany them with their financing needs. Um, as we heard, there's a whole list of issues that we could talk about today that have immense impact in our activity, but we are going to try to focus the debate around three major ones. The threats to and the opportunities stemming from the EU decisive climate commitments, as, as were expressed at COP26 in Glasgow last year. The impacts of inflation and lower growth prospects in our, on our industry, and the impact of the crisis on globalization and multilateralism, although uh, from what we heard from Martin Wolf, um, it's already dead. So we'll <laughs> see what this implies for a company. It is my pleasure today to introduce a panel of extremely qualified experts in international finance um, who will share with us their uh, particular standpoints on the situation. They're all very knowledgeable about the factors behind the demand for financing and behind the availability or, or scarcity of financing for international companies. Uh, Silvia Iranzo in the middle is uh, an expert in trade and finance as well as in corporate governance and sustainability. She is a former Secretary of State for Trade and she's currently a member of the boards at ICO, the in Instituto de Crédito Oficial, Spanish Official Credit Institute, as well as at, at Indra Sistemas, a listed company where she chairs the Sustainability Commission. At the end of the panel, um, with very extensive experience in structured finance and export credit, Mikal Ron is the Chief International Officer of SACE, the Italian ECA. She's also the current elected president of the Bern Union, a global association of export credit insurers, both private and political. And she has headed SACE's participation at the OECD and EU fora, where export credit regulations were discussed and made, as well as having chaired the International Working Group, uh, an OECD initiative to reach out to non-arrangement countries and try to come about with a, with a global set of rules for export finance. And finally, uh, to my left, our banker in the panel, Andre Casal, is Managing Director and Global Head for Export Finance at Credit Agricole Corporate and Investment Bank in Paris. He has experience with a whole range of ECA, multilateral and private insurance programs in, in support of international finance. He has also been president of the French Banking Federation's Export Finance Committee since 2016 and is a member of the Export Finance Committee of the International Chamber of Commerce Banking Association. So without further delays, um, we'll go into our discussion. We'll start talking about the green transition that we already heard about in the previous panel. I'll, I'll start with you, Silvia. Last year, as uh, economies seemed to be bouncing back quickly from the pandemic crisis, we heard very firm and, and, and further commitments from Europe regarding the energy transition. 
um, we've heard, and it is clear this energy transition is going to have different impacts in different industries and in different countries. It was also, and it still is, I think, initially seen as providing companies with new investment and growth opportunities. Uh, do you think that the energy crisis in Europe, the poorer growth prospects, the high indebtedness levels, are going to impact the levels of ambition that we saw the end of last year, beginning of this year? Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, to add a little bit of color to this short introduction that you made, um, today the world is heading for substantially lower growth. So the IMF just downgraded growth prospects. We were thinking of 4.4% growth, and now this is 36 both in 2022 and 2023. Of course, that will require a lot of investment, but clearly investment needs will necessary, necessarily go down because of, of lower growth. Um, and just to add a little color to these raw figures, um, it's interesting to note that um, some of the most affected countries by these new war forecasts by the IMF are the four biggest countries in the EU, including Spain, um, also Japan and the UK, and obviously Russia and Ukraine. And a country that has greatly benefited, apparently, from this new scenario is uh, Saudi Arabia, with nearly three additional percentage points of growth, but obviously it's very closely related with the energy transition, sorry, with the energy crisis that we are seeing, okay, downside risks to the forecast. And this is very important because this 3.6% um, um, could be in danger if the war worsens or if there's an escalation of sanctions on Russia or there's a sharper than anticipated deceleration in China or a renewed flare up of the pandemic. And I'm citing literally with the IMF says. Um, so the environment that we're looking into is filled with uncertainty more than ever because we have had three successive shocks, one on top of the other, and we haven't come out of one of the shocks and we have our new shock. So um, this of course is going to hurt investment because in order to invest one of the things that you need is a little bit of certainty you never have full certainty, but um, in my opinion, we are living in a, in a world filled with uncertainties like possibly never before. And on top of that, the world is demanding more sustainability. And on top of that, we are looking into higher interest rates, probably, probably, certainly, we, we already have that situation, both in the US and the EU. And, um, we have much less scope for fiscal stimulus given that public debts have risen dramatically and um, um, ratings, sovereign ratings and private ratings in general have gone down of late. And then enter the energy crisis, as you said. So um, again, to illustrate it, the barrel of Brent oil has gone up in two years from 28 dollars per barrel to 129, and uh, natural gas has multiplied its prices fourfold in one year. So that's very big. Um, part of the reason for this crisis, and I'm not the one to say it, the IMF is saying that, is that uh, the EU regulations on energy transition have led to a fall by 20% of investment in EMP, exploration and production of oil and gas. So of course this has affected supply negatively. So this is already one of the impacts that we're looking into. Now the EU has announced recently that it wishes to reduce um, gas imports from Russia by two thirds this year. Will that be possible? So many institutions and consulting firms have looked into that, and I have looked into a report by FDI Consulting, and this report says that the European Union can reduce one-third of Russian gas imports this year by sourcing gas from other 
countries, such as notably the United States, Norway, um, Qatar, uh, or even Azerbaijan. What about the second third? Now, the second third could only be accomplished this year, as the EU wishes, um, by operating nuclear plants and by continuing operating coal-fired plants. And here I'm thinking especially Germany and Poland. But that is absolutely necessary if we want to meet these goals. Therefore, definitely there is a trade-off between reducing uh, dependence on Russian gas imports and uh, sticking by uh, a number of goals because we're talking about increasing coal. Uh, there's also negative impact because the gas that we are going to import instead of the Russian one is LNG, which is more expensive than the one we are importing from Russia, and, and so on. And then we have the danger of social tensions because of higher prices, etc. Now, um, as for the third third, uh, this could only be accomplished by 2025 with more renewables that, would, um, um, that we have invested in today, but that we would only see the result in some years, and new gas fields, and so on. But of course, given the environment of uncertainty, given higher interest rates, um, given policies that aim at capping energy prices in some countries, if these are not designed very carefully, you could find yourself in a situation where companies do not wish to invest. So um, there are many risks linked to this situation, and um, I don't want to take up other person's time, but um, I'm, I'm just going to mention, to finish, a contradiction in EU energy policy that we're seeing today. Um, fracking, gas and oil is banned in the European Union, but the European Union has approached the U.S. to see about buying more shale gas to the U.S. Isn't that a contradiction? Um, I hope it's just a short-term one. Um, yes, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, you mentioned there may be reluctance to invest, there is, um, we, we heard today uh, before that there is a massive uh, amount of public funds available from the EU to invest in, in the green transition. Um, the, the objective too is to mobilize private financing. Um, normally, Andre, higher interest rates are good news for banks. Um, in this particular context that we are living, however, and with all the other conditionings that we have been hearing about in the morning, do you think that the, um, the ability and willingness of companies to invest in the energy transition from that access to financing or to reasonably priced financing is going to be affected? Banks have their own sustainability finance goals, oftentimes in numbers and gross amount of business that needs to be done. Um, do you think there's going to be a flight to quality, a competition for projects in the sustainable sectors, probably at the expense of more traditional industries um, that have uh, been in our portfolios and in our activity lately? Is there going to be a different impact for investment in developed versus developing economies? So Many questions. Like I know, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> first of all, first of all uh, uh, Carmen, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to this panel, and uh, it's a great thank opportunity you. to be here thank with uh, a very distinguished panel. That, uh, uh, and Cese has uh, extended this invitation on its 50th anniversary, which is uh, quite significant as well, so thank you for that. Um, I'll try and answer this question, but I, I, I do want to start with the fact that uh, I would not put interest rates as at the heart of the reasons impacting the investment in uh, the energy transition. Uh, as Sylvia mentioned, you have several shocks that have uh, uh, happened, and I would like to mention three shocks. One is the, the, the shock of supply, the shock of demand, and the shock of confidence. Uh, when we talk about demand, we talk about uh, obviously inflation, and which leads to higher interest rates. Uh, so this is a, one of the factors that comes into the equation. Then you have the demand factor, which is the supply chain disruptions, um, which, uh, uh, sorry, the supply uh, uh, 
risk rather the the, the shock it, which comes from the uh, supply chain disruptions and the uh, the the disruptions in production uh, and then you have the investment uh, that is impacted by the lack of confidence and the lack of uh, uh, ability to foresee where you're going and this is what is slowing down the investments as we see it from the banking perspective in some of the uh, the sectors you, what you have is this geopolitical situation that's creating a new environment of risk and of uh, extreme volatility which is uh, leading companies to think twice before they invest as to where they're going to invest and whether they have the means to um, to invest. Europe happens to be one of the most impacted by, by this crisis, uh, the, be it the geopolitical or the economic crisis. Uh, but uh, Europe also has the most ambitious pro program in terms of uh, energy transition and it's the most committed to climate change. So you have a risk here today with the Ukraine crisis of having a diversion of funds from uh, what was meant for the energy transition towards uh, addressing the uh, uh, energy shortages and uh, self-sufficiency within Europe. Um, and, and this could have two, two uh, implications. Either it uh, disrupts the progress in terms of investments in energy transition, or it actually accelerates it because of this need to, for self-sufficiency. Uh, it could accelerate the, the investment in, in uh, energy transition. Now we're seeing um, uh, a lot of industries that are already investing in that, you, you, especially in uh, hard to abate uh, industries where uh, they need, uh, you know, they have cap carbon capture and hydrogen investments, which are intended to reduce uh, the uh, CO2 emissions. So th there's, there's a lot of progress there. But let me come back to your question about what the banks are seeing in there. And uh, it comes back to what was uh, mentioned by Sylvia, the regulation. And uh, the banks are following the EU taxonomy. Uh, the EU taxonomy is basically, uh, as it was drafted in, at the end of 2019, was uh, basically saying um, there's good, good things to invest in and bad things. And if you're investing in significant, you're providing significant contribution to the EU environmental um, objectives, then that's a green and that's therefore acceptable. Everything else was bad. So obviously when you have that kind of, that, that kind of scenario, it leads you to uh, invest most of your, or divert most of your funds towards uh, these types of investments. Um, having said that, uh, there's been, um, a readjustment that is being proposed. In March, uh, the EU Commission came up with an, uh, an, a proposed amendment to the taxonomy, which would be very positive, because what it does is um, it's an extension to, adduce, to introduce other performance factors. Um, it recognizes, for instance, a difference in uh, uh, the starting points of uh, different borrowers and different countries, and the transition potential of those countries. So it created what, instead of just having a green category, you now have an amber category, which would be uh, between what is called uh, significant harm, which is the, the bad, and the green. Um, they've also introduced a, a lower environmental impact category, which is basically neutral. So anything that is, has no impact, positive or negative, can also be considered. So this opens a door for financing, uh, notably emerging markets, because before that, when you look at the, the, the taxonomy as it was drafted, basically you'd have the flight to quality that you mentioned and everybody would be moving towards uh, just the, the, the green and probably uh, in, in Europe primarily, because that was the intent of the, the taxonomy. Um, so today I think there's, there's a window of opportunity for that. Having said that, I think that uh, generally speaking, banks, um, uh, are also falling behind a bit in terms of how much they disclose uh, their uh, uh, evaluation of sustainability in their own books as well as that of their clients. Um, and 15% uh, of the EU banks disclose their own emissions, which is very low. And 20% share the strategies on uh, aligning with the uh, Paris Accord. So uh, what you have is uh, a lot of banks that are not announcing what exactly they're going to do about it, uh, and some that are very organized and have plans. 
Um, so we at our bank, what we've decided is to exit coal. Uh, we have a transition towards exiting gas and uh, oil uh, over the medium term. Um, and you have also the, the uh, we've also, we're also developing tools to analyze the, uh, the transition factors within um, the, the, our, our clients uh, by sc scoring the transition uh, prog progress. So um, I think also there's another element that's been ignored in this uh, uh, taxonomy before, and that was the social element. Yeah. One was only talking about green and energy transition, but there's the social element that is also quite important and that had been forgotten. Uh, so fortunately, it seems that uh, the, the, the new draft of the taxonomy would allow social loans to be uh, included in that. So I think already 2050 objectives are going to be very challenging, probably unattainable, to be honest, as was mentioned uh, earlier by Martin Wolf, and I think we all concur with that. Um, but I think that uh, what we can do is, is, from our side, try and develop whatever we can to assist this, uh, this energy transition. And um, as you mentioned, I'm part of the uh, ICC, and at the ICC we came up with a white paper which was intended to uh, collaborate with the ECAs and have common, um, a, a common framework within which we can uh, operate and uh, uh, that would allow uh, criteria and definition of what is considered a green loan, what is considered a social loan. We want to come up with at least a definition of what we all agree upon as being that, so that you avoid greenwashing and uh, other factors. Uh, we also wanted to uh, come up with the common objectives and uh, uh, develop incentives, ideally, with, ideally within the OECD arrangement. Well, probably <laughs> let me compliment that part because I think you um, you basically uh, put it in a tray for for her to continue and share with us what ECA's strategies to to accompany uh, our corporates in this in this transition have been in the last in the last few years, most notably in the last few months, really, um, putting RCCAs, Teste, Sache, and many others in a, in, in a sometimes difficult position uh, because we have to obey our initial born mandate to support our exporters, but we also have to go into fields of trying to steer them in, into this transformation. Um, there are some incentives to do that. We're trying to put them in place. Uh, initiatives like the white paper from the ICC Commission was, uh, were very welcome and, and centered the debate. But Mikal, please um, let us know what, what your views and, and what things that have been done in the last few months have been. Thank you, Carmen. I, I will, however, open in, in brackets, you know, just really thank you for having me here on such a significant date and uh, year, rather, and congratulations to Sese because 50 years is a big deal and I'm absolutely honoured with this panel to be here today to oh, celebrate with you. you and your customers. So I would just uh, depart from the fact that there are many initiatives. So the most obvious you've all heard about is, of course, the COP26, the Glasgow Declaration. But there's also been the Export for Future, which is known as E3F. I mean, in the private sector, there's been the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, as well as Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. There are plenty of initiatives, maybe even too many initiatives. We are surrounded by these initiatives. However, these are largely initiatives that were approved at government level. Not only, but largely. Uh, and we, as ECAs, were actually left with, you know, the done deal on a table. Um, I would be as bold as saying we were left to clean the mess up in terms of policy making now that should implement these very honorable declarations. Um, and with all these initiatives, what comes out very evident to me is that uh, they do often differ between them quite significantly in terms of scope, but also membership, also, um, and more importantly, the proposed time frame, the timeline to achieve the results, 
and the required action, we can't even agree right now on common definitions between these initiatives as to what constitutes you know, green, for instance. And then one of the biggest challenges that we often, you know, uh, do not discuss is actually, you know, the phasing out strategy, the reconversion or the need to reconvert companies that are currently active in, in fossil fuel sector. Uh, and that means their supply chain, but it also means their respective workforce, employment. So governments which made these declarations and adhered to these agreements should definitely also shortly implement supporting measures for the companies to undertake this energy trans uh, transition and accompany not only the phasing out from fossil fuels but also to some extent, not necessarily through the resources, uh, assist also in uh, phasing in of the renewable energy sources. And I won't repeat what has already been said about the EU and you mentioned, of course, there is the new Green Deal. And this brings us to specifically the ECAs that we see the challenge is such that it depends on the country and the industrial and export base of each country, the ones they're exposed to in terms of the carbon intensive sectors. So even within the EU, uh, this is the case for countries such as, I like that song, it's Italian, great, thank you. <laughs> so we see countries such as Italy, where I come from, but also Germany that are highly exposed to, if you want, the oil and gas sector through their exporters. And then you see countries such as Sweden and Denmark, which are typically and traditionally um, exporting, you know, climate friendly technologies. Uh, and therefore the global scenario becomes even more complex when you actually look at countries that adhere to these agreements, um, such as the US, where we still see fracking and flaring activities actually increasing since they adhered to the COP26. And we see an increased use of carbon intensive plants in the United States. That's just one example. So basically um, what I'm saying is, uh, and then of course, um, I do not wish to forget uh, the Ukraine crisis that will clearly aggravate this conversion of the fossil fuels industry because, you know, will we as Martin Wolf mentioned today, manage um, to keep on track, on the green track, notwithstanding, if you want, problems on the supply chain and the sources of energy. It's not a certainty. And the risk is, of course, those countries that have not got access to diversified sources of energy, that they will return to more polluting you know, fossil fuels, namely coal. And we see that already happening, also in the EU, quite clearly. So basically, what I'd like to say is that there isn't really a one-size-fits-all solution, not even within the European country, a uh, European Union, and there is no one single country or even a single institution that can do this, you know, uh, path, go through this path on its own. Uh, the green transition is definitely something that requires much more coordination than what we've seen so far. And that includes not just export credit agencies and beyond the governments, we're looking at the DFIs, of course, the banking sector, which we're already coordinating with, but also private insurance, multilaterals, etc. cetera. Um, just the last note in terms of what we've seen just in the last few months, especially in the Middle East, we've actually seen successful green transactions. So leaving aside now the declarations and the doom and gloom we heard this morning, we did see transactions not just labeled as green, but that have incentives in terms of both the bank premium coming down at, and also the ECAs facilitating the green transition through special incentives within the loan agreement. And that is a great direction, but again, very few, and these are just green shoots, and. I have no certainty that the momentum will be kept throughout the next two, three years. Thank you. Thank you, all three. Let's um, go on to the next 
range of issues that also affect greatly uh, the, the environment that we have to operate in. Um, I'd like to talk about the impact of inflation, high interest rates on corporates and public debtors in a context of, as we said, lower growth prospects. Um, Sylvia, you expressed clearly we are facing lower growth uh, prospects, lower and even lower if certain conditions uh, remain, like the, the war situation, etc. Um, this coupled with increased levels of debt throughout public and corporate, my condition responses to inflationary pressures. Uh, we heard today too that pure monetary policy doesn't exist anymore. Um, what is your take on what uh, central bankers are facing today? How do you see their dilemmas evolving? Okay, well, that's a, a very good question. Um, again, to add color to the situation that we have, um, in September 2021, which is the latest data that I could find, um, according to IIF, global debt reached $300 trillion. Um, I remember that back when the subprime crisis struck, um, uh, policymakers and, and corporations and banks swore that they would never be there again. But the truth is, global debt today is higher than what it was back in 2008. Um, private debt, it has multiplied tenfold in the last 10 years. And that in itself is going to lead to a deceleration of growth of at least 0.9% in advanced countries in the next three years and 1.3% in emerging countries. Um, and as Martin Wolf said, um, a, a, a debt crisis could be looming and he is quite certain that that is going to happen. Um, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm as sure as he is, but uh, we do have a problem with debt. And if you compound that with rising interest rates, and, and I'm going to talk about that right now, well, you can feel the degree of risk that the whole system is posing in different ways because crises, financial crises never have the same shape, but um, the consequences are pretty similar. Um, anyway, out of that total debt, 100 trillion is sovereign debt, and the rest is private debt. Now, what about inflation? Because high inflation is what is going to lead to higher interest rates. So inflation is projected at 5.7% in advanced countries this year, and 8.7% in emerging countries, which is a lot. And even in the United States, we're seeing some a uh, price wage spiral. We could be hinting at that. Anyway, it's funny, and I think Martin Wolf also mentioned the fact that in the United States, inflationary pressures are due to overheating, so excess demand, but in Europe, inflation is more due to the energy crunch that we are suffering. So uh, if you think of it, well, anyway, um, these high inflation rates uh, call for action by central banks, and I'm afraid they have no option because it's in their mandate. So in the case of the ECB, we're really far from that 2% or nearly 2%. So of course they need to act upon high inflationary pressures and inevitably that will lead to a substantial rise, I think, in, in interest rates. And in fact, we're already seeing that in the German bonds and, and so on. Um, and I'm just gonna make a comment on, on how unfair the world can be, but this is the global world. So take the European Union. Uh, we have no business in this high inflation rate because we're not an oil and gas producer and, um, and we don't have excess demand either. So uh, not on the demand front, not on the supply front, but these high prices are due to a war. They are due to perhaps a lot of demand still in Asia and in China, uh, and yet, we're gonna suffer directly the consequences because maybe we will need to go through a recession to push those rates down. Um, and um, in investment is going to fall by 6.5% because of that. And I would like to mention perhaps the role of state development banks. Um, just a little word on that. In the case of Spain, ECO has stepped in 
it, it did so in the past crises, it did so in the pandemic, and perhaps, well, what, 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 is, what is in for ECO in this energy crisis? Perhaps it could help in, in financing more renewables, I don't know. They're already doing a lot with a balance sheet of 37.7%, of, 37 uh, of sorry, 37.7 billion euros, and they have taken the lead in issuing green bonds and, and such like. So we can expect that they are going to help a lot. Um, and yeah, that's about it, back to you. Andre, <laughs> back to you. You mentioned that the EU taxonomy changes introduced recently might allow for a continuance of, um, for us continuing to finance emerging economies. However, we've been concerned with uh, growing indebtedness in the emerging world, even before the pandemic, the situation of many debt distressed countries is likely to um, worsen with the, with probably concerns such as food concerns that were mentioned also by Martin Wolf this morning. What are your views on, on that sustainability? It's not only an emerging countries uh, concern. As we heard, we, we also have very high levels of corporate debt in Europe. Um, how is this going to affect your industry, the banking industry? You're going to have to be <laughs> very selective, which also means winners and losers. We're going to save the world. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it doesn't look too chance. good. It doesn't. It doesn't look too good. Um, I mean, uh, as as was mentioned, uh, the the debt level at state level. I mean, look at how much uh, the states have have borrowed in Europe just to finance the uh, the economy, to continue financing the economy, and the support that has been given with the help of the ECAs, by the way, in a big way to the corporates during the pandemic, uh, has increased the debt load on the corporates to a large extent. The low interest rate environment also has prompted a lot of the corporates to borrow big time. And um, the thing is, the emerging markets have also benefited from that. They, they, they use the benefit of the, the low rates, uh, the, uh, the low oil prices at one point as well, uh, to borrow to, to basically develop their economies. There's a lot of infrastructure needs. Uh, and let me focus a little bit on sub-Saharan Africa because I think that's a good example. Uh, if you look at a, a bit of history there, in 2000, um, the, there was an initiative to pardon external debt uh, of the uh, low-income, highly indebted countries. So the, it was reduced between 2000 and 2004. Uh, so in four years, it was reduced from 180 billion to 100 billion. Just to put it in the context, today it's over 400 billion. So you've gone fourfold, their, their external debt has increased fourfold in 15 years. Um, this is obviously due, as, as I mentioned, to uh, the healthier D GDP growth and uh, uh, low oil prices, low interest rates, etc. Uh, but there are also two elements that came into play. One is the Chinese bilateral loans that were made to Sub-Saharan Africa in return, of course, for some favors. Um, there was 150 billion of Chinese uh, loans, bilateral loans into Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the capital markets as well opened up. They were looking for yields. And uh, so they went to the emerging markets and the emerging markets uh, said, sure, give me money. And so that's, that's what happened. Um, to, to the point where we're today, uh, the uh, average indebtedness um, has gone up from 33% of GDP to 57% of GDP in 10 years. Um, and uh, you know, then, then came in this, um, the, the, the pandemic, um, which uh, was, was met with some support from the international institutions with the DSSI, which is the Debt Sustainability Suspension Initiative, which basically pushed back some of these um, uh, loans that are due by two to four years. So all they did was push back the problem. And then comes the, um, the, the, the situation now with the war, which aggravates the problem even further. Um, and we're seeing lower growth prospects, of course. We're seeing uh, higher inflation. We're seeing higher cost of borrowing. Uh, and with some of these sovereign debts that were done by the capital markets, uh, they, they basically have to repay those in a bullet uh, payment, which means refinancing risk. 
So um, to, essentially, we're going into a wall here, and uh, I think it's, um, uh, I'm not adding to this the political risks which come with uh, uh, the social unrest that could happen because of uh, food supply, because of uh, uh, what's happening geopolitically. Um, so where does that leave us as banks? I think, uh, and ECAs, because it's not just for the banks, it's for the ECAs as well. Uh, basically, we have to be a lot more cautious as to whom we lend to. We have to be a lot more smart about analyzing the, the risks of the, uh, the counterparties. We cannot just lend on and uh, you know, add to this problem. So uh, we have to help them out with that. I think there's a lot of IMF programs that are in place today. So we're monitoring what's happening through these IMF programs in the different countries. Uh, we're paying attention to governance. That's very important as well. And uh, we're looking at priority projects. And the priority projects are in what is really needed, which is basically uh, energy transition and social development. And with that, I'm talking about uh, hospitals, I'm talking about uh, uh, water, uh, bringing water to some, some cities, etc., and some of the infrastructure projects. So I think, I think uh, one has to be very careful and smart about this. Another thing to remember is that with the, uh, uh, some of these countries that were, when they were borrowing before, did not, were not subjected to the uh, equator principle uh, requirements, which basically impose uh, an environmental due diligence. Uh, so now we have that uh, under EP4, which is increasing the cost of financing those projects for those emerging markets. So the, it just adds up, and I, I wish I could be more positive and more optimistic. Well, we, we are living dangerous times. <laughs> and, um, well, you mentioned ECAs. ECAs are usually called to, to step up at times like this of increased risk of, of the need, a, a maintained need, a sustained need to finance investments that, as you said, are prioritary, prioritary for, for the countries, uh, also priorities for our exporters that we are um, supposed to, to keep on uh, supporting. We are expected ECAs to deploy the full range of instruments in support of our companies and, and our debtors, investors outside. However, in the last few years, um, the previous two crises, we have seen, we have witnessed how the domestic programs of ECAs grew. Um, important parts of our portfolio today uh, consist of Spanish risk, in our case, Italian risk. Uh, from what we hear and the concerns with debt sustainability also outside of our, of our developed world, how do you see the situation evolving? Are we going to go back to our traditional foreign debt or portfolios? Are we staying with more domestic exposure? Mikhail, what is your... I think it's been really a very uh, fascinating time for ECAs. It's the first time ever in the history of ECAs that, you know, the major support was shifted away from export and internationalization as such, the traditional, if you want, support to domestic markets. And uh, not in every single country, but many governments implemented during the pandemic times. Uh, special programs, um, quite a few um, through the issuance of um, financial guarantees backed by the government in support of um, the local companies, so injecting liquidity, especially to SMEs, but not only, also large and mid-cap companies that were particularly impacted by the pandemic in industries such as transportation, aviation, tourism, uh, just to name a few. And then, of course, um, our role continued to be that of trying to assist in order to avoid major defaults. So that's both in the domestic market, but also uh, back to Andre's explanation of the DSSI in terms of clearly also sovereign, um, if you want, debtors. Um, these programs have been obviously um, issued also by government decrees as um, uh, emergency programs. So your specific question on the time frame, um, whilst we don't really know because most of these programs have now been renewed, but 
so far, so good. We see the renewal dates um, becoming shorter and shorter in terms of the extension. And the last one we have currently is um, end of June this year to be seen what happens next. But um, ECA, such as for instance, such in Italy, were actually used for this specific purpose. Our mandate was changed all of a sudden, overnight. Um, during a period that we were all working from home, so thanks to the di digitalization process that took uh, place in earlier years, we were able to do it. But it is extraordinary to what extent, you know, our, if you want, modus operandi changed uh, during these last two years, because uh, just to give you an idea of the magnitude, um, such in Italy, had issued um, what is called the Garanzia Italia, this form of domestic guarantee, supported clearly by the banks. They provided the funding and we provided the guarantee. So we're looking at 18 months roughly, um, up till last month, 39 billion euro of financial guarantees were issued by Sace to the domestic market. This is extraordinary. Now we are not obviously the only ECA that has done so. There are quite a few, um, maybe in some countries they've used other instruments, as we heard from Silvia, uh, but it also applies to some non-EU countries, such as Canada. And the question is whether it's going to continue or not. Um, I believe that we're actually going to go back to more or less a normal, if you want, um, previous way of working. But the instrument of you know assisting or supporting domestic market is definitely going to be used again because governments took a liking to it it worked it could be considered as a relative success story of course not always looking at the debt implications but um, all in all, I believe that, for instance, with the war currently in Ukraine, and also in terms of the green transition, we will assist more and more the domestic market, also in the green transition, but not only. So I think it's there to stay, but the good news is that we are seeing, if I'm looking at the burn union figures, which gives you an idea of all the export credit, if you want, world um, numbers, at the moment, what we are seeing is, first of all, a very big comeback to medium long-term transactions that were basically halted for the large part of the pandemic years. So we have a rebound, and it's really driven by resurgence of very large new projects, especially, especially in the transportation, manufacturing, and renewable energies. So that's the very good news. And we've seen also an increase in cross-border activity of over 9%, um, above what was pre-pandemic time. So I'm looking at 2021 compared to 2019. And all of this is brilliant news, and clearly there is a 26% increase in support through the domestic market to companies in internationalization. So that's a 26% increase 2021 compared to pre-pandemic terms. So there are signs that ECAs are coming back to what they know best, but I believe that it's going to become a structural and a permanent change that this will be accompanied by support to the domestic market. In terms of DSSI, if I can just add to Andres' comments, the figures are actually stunning of what we have at the moment. Um, We're looking at 13 billion US dollars for 42 countries that has been approved, and three countries have already requested access to, to the common framework, uh, all in Africa. So in that sense, I think we are extremely concerned as to future years. I, I didn't mention, by the way, that we did have our first default on the sovereign. Just you wanted did. to mention, yes, Sri oh. Lanka uh, went, oh, into no, default, yeah. went into default last, last month. So that's hopefully not the first of many, but it's um, just to put things in perspective. Well, um, I, I think we were all clear after the several interventions before that uh, that distress is a reality and how we manage that in the next two years will condition 
uh, both banking and ECA's activity for for a few years. Um, still, let's let's try to be more optimistic than the previous speakers on this topic, but there's very few reasons to do so. We have a red signal there that we're almost uh, into the final 10, uh, 12 minutes of our panel. I, I wanted to close uh, talking about globalization and multilateralism. Uh, we've heard that globalization is basically dead. We're going towards regionalization. Um, and multilateralism well, it su it suffered severe blows in the last few months. So um, in this context, um, are we going to see patterns of investment and in, in different geographies change in a permanent way, Sylvia? Do you think that this crisis is permanent, is going to produce a new paradigm? Well, I don't know about permanent. Anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can only speak to what is on now, and, uh, and, and I hope that some things are not permanent. Yeah. But for now, yes, I think that some trade patterns will change. Um, I don't need to uh, dwell more on, on Martin Wolf talks about the deglobalization process that we, we have been seeing basically since the Great Recession. And now we've had two additional shocks to globalization, which is the pandemic and the war. And they both speak to the need to secure supplies, at least vital supplies. In the pandemic, we, we, we suffered the de dependence on, on medical supplies from China. There were no masks, whatnot. And now, with the war in Ukraine, we are suffering this dependence on, on imported gas from, from Russia. Also imported oil, but to a lesser extent, and it's easier to replace it in spot markets than uh, the case of natural gas. So um, the changes that I think that we will see is shortening of supply chains in general. And um, as for sectors, well, most obviously, we're going to see uh, less oil and gas exports from Russia, because even though they export more to China, but China knows better than to become dependent on Russia. China is carrying out lots of investments to attain self-sufficiency in energy. So I don't see that repeating in the case of China. So less oil and gas exports from Russia, um, more exports of gas, at least in the very short term, more exports of gas from other producers such as US, Qatar, um, Norway, um, Trinidad, Tobago, Mo even Mozambique, whatnot. And also oil with more oil coming from the US, Saudi Arabia, and so on. Um, and um, as I said, we want to secure our, our supplies. In the longer term, um, probably oil and gas producers will or could be out of business in the longer term. So they will need to diversify away from those productions. And, and in the case of Europe, hopefully, we will live off renewable energies. And therefore, there will be no need for that. And of course, global trade will suffer because a great proportion of global trade consists of trade in oil and gas. So again, we will see deglobalization, at least this is what the figures will tell us. Okay, let's hope that other opportunities appear for our companies in this construction of this self-sufficient Europe and, and other areas of the world when it comes to energy production. Um, Mikhail, you have been, ever since I know you, uh, um, um, a spokesperson for multilateralism, common rules applying to all major uh, exporting countries and governments. However, would you say that what, what we have here, uh, heard, um, the recent trends in the ECA world, the new catalogs of products, you think that uh, ECAs are diverging in and in, in starting to compete against each other? Do we still have a small island of multilateralism in the ECA world. Um, what is your take on this? Well, my take is I, I agree, Lies. Uh, everything said and done, and this morning was very clear coming from the, the key speaker. 
uh, that it is a very, if you want, a fragile moment in terms of multilateralism. I also um, lived through an experience that was uh, doing very nicely indeed, the IWG International Working Group, that was originally initiated by President Xi in China and President Obama as a means to rewriting, if you want, the export credit rules, but including this time also non-OECD members to ensure level playing field. And that eventually failed at the end because whilst technically we did so much and we reached so far, um, the geopolitics got involved and the tensions between the US, China with support of the EU meant suspending the initiative. But all the same, I remain optimistic because even the recent um, efforts conducted by the EU as a bloc are all proof that multilateralism, notwithstanding its flaws, is the only way because there's not really any better alternative. There isn't. I, you know, I appeal to those who think they know better if they can come up with some other solution, but unilateralism, um, you know, Europe, great, China, great, uh, Africa, is, it's not really a win-win uh, strategy. We have seen it not, not winning at all. Um, Burn Union is a good example because we have both, uh, you know, China, USA, but also Iran and uh, Israel and uh, the whole world in a dialogue at a technical level without any intervention on the geopolitical side. And it works very well, so it gives me a lot of confidence that it is the only way. And I also want to mention that unlike politics, the export uh, credit industry is naturally, by definition, oriented towards a long-term perspective. So even whilst we're working now to mitigate, if you want, the risks in the present time, we must stay focused on, on the long term. This is a privilege we have compared to political issues. And we need to keep on working to promote a healthy and sustainable growth and above all to support global trade the growth of global trade. Um, and if we don't do so, I don't think there is much hope, honestly, even to an important bloc such as Europe. So I remain optimistic, conditionally, but I think it's the only way. Thank you, Mikal. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions and actually some questions coming in from the audience. Uh, so maybe we can Look at the questions, answer them now, and, and have a few minutes, two, three minutes for a sentence for, from each to conclude the, the session. Um, for André Gassel, uh, the, the issue of financing the defense industry that came up in the previous panel, what are the challenges for companies and banks when it comes to defense financing? Well, the challenges are more from a, uh, a standpoint of uh, public opinion, but I think uh, the, uh, the banks are still the ones that are active in defense, uh, uh, financing the defense exports, uh, will continue to do that because uh, their client base uh, is active in that, uh, in, in that sector. So I don't see uh, the banks that are active because there are some that have a defense policy that don't touch uh, the defense sector. So I'm not speaking about those, but those that are in the defense sector are active with their exporters, so they will continue uh, to support them. And would you say that the, 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 the withdrawal from the dis defense sector is something that's growing, or did it happen and, and the banks that stay not, are not I, suffering too much I pressure? Have not, I have not seen it happen. I have not seen a withdrawal. Um, if there has been, then it must be uh, anecdotic uh, situations. It's not a common... Uh, common uh, uh, Okay, because my impression is it happened for a couple of years there. There was pressure well, the and, and banks. The taxonomy, actually, the, the way it was drafted, was, was uh, discouraging companies, yes. uh, banks, from actually pursuing the, the defense sector. Um, but since the, 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 we're talking about uh, banks being uh, evaluated based on their green asset ratio in 2024, I think today no, no bank has changed its policy on this. And I, 
anticipate that with the new revision of the taxonomy, that that's not going to be a, an issue anymore because uh, we're, we're having, I mean, you can even look at defense as being social. Uh, I mean, that's pushing it a bit, but there are uh, in the defense sector, I know it's, it's funny, but there, there are actually in the defense sector, there are, uh, if you look at what's happening in Ukraine, that's considered saving people. So, I mean, that's pushing the envelope in terms of interpretation. But I'm telling you, the, the defense sector industry is actually trying to incorporate this into the taxonomy. Okay. But I'm not saying, I'm not saying <laughs> I, I have no, no view on that. I'm just saying what is happening. Okay. Um, we have another question that I'm going to ask Mikal, but if any of you have also something to add, please feel free. Um, what is greener or more ESG? An oil and gas field in the North Sea under UK regulation and full scrutiny, or the example is an open mine of nickel in a country with no regulation. Are we, we are facing those sorts of challenges uh, when, you, when you sort of demonize an entire industry. Is the same deal the same as green or as black if, if it's under full scrutiny and with the right elements or not? Uh, it's a great question and I won't actually answer it directly in terms of which of those two examples. All I can say is in terms of defining policies um, that will be the work of each ECA, um, mostly using the EU taxonomy but not only with variations. I would say that um, definitely we should be very accommodating to differentiate uh, between you know different segments of each sector um, to differentiate for instance if you want in the oil and gas definitely between um, upstream midstream and downstream uh, but also to look at exceptions to look at you know issues that are more related to SMEs um, so all this means for me being pragmatic and not taking a broad stroke approach and calling this green and this is not because also energy efficiency meaning to say reducing emissions, but not necessarily through green technology, pure green, is for me green. So there will be a lot of interpretation, but we have to take a very realistic approach and not be Taliban's in terms of this yes, this no. Uh, a little bit more accommodating also for companies in transition phase. I fully agree with that. I think uh, you cannot look at it as black or white. You have to look at what, is, what that project is actually bringing uh, that is positive as well. So you look at not just the negative aspects of it, but the positives as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a third question that's specifically directed to Silvia. Uh, uh, kind of a million dollar question. How can we best now live in this world filled with uncertainties like never before? In policy planning, how do we adapt our frameworks or even drop some of them? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a tall order. Um, well, what, what I can say is that w we're living a moment, we're in the middle of a crossroads here because um, we don't know if we're gonna recover or we're going to be pulled back into recession. Uh, we don't know if we're aiming at a cleaner world or we have to accept reluctantly that we still li live on oil and gas. Um, we don't know if we want for more government intervention or for less. Uh, whatever we do, whatever we decide, um, my take is that mm, we, we, we should lead the world in, in the democratic world in the world where there are checks and balances should try to, to lead the world into what is best into how best to achieve all of our goals because if we do not do that in a consistent manner others will do that for us and i hope and pray that uh, that self-serving autocracies will not do that for us and that applies to policies and that applies to, to most everything but i think that this is a crucial moment in history okay and i think we're going to conclude we have a few minutes left uh would each of you uh like to specify one threat one short-term threat that you see in this situation 
and one opportunity, one note of optimism that we can give the audience today. So we can start with you, Mikal. Okay, I will look um, uh, forward to the next few years, so it's really a window to the future that we haven't discussed in much length, and I think the ECAs will definitely be increasingly involved in uh, supporting both their domestic companies and their foreign uh, partners in terms of supply chain diversification and energy security. But what it means is that we will have to be definitely more proactive in identifying new destination markets. I am certain about that. For our exports, above all, but also potential new suppliers for our domestic companies. So looking at import substitution is not something I would rule out for the future. So this process is definitely going to create a lot of disruption, but it will also introduce, back to your question, these new opportunities, especially if we think about frontier um, economies that have not yet been explored. So this is really what I would look at, proactive and to think out, out of the box on new solutions that have not been tested before. Good. Um. Sylvia? Yes, well, my final comment would be along the lines of what I just said. Um, we live in a global world, uh, albeit in, in, in um, perhaps we're phasing it out in some sectors, but still we are in a global world with global problems that can only be addressed cooperatively. So um, my final comment is, is a call for cooperative action. Uh, I set the example of monetary policies in Europe being determined by events outside of Europe, but that can apply to most everything. So um, when we talk about the US and the European Union and China and whatnot, I think it's in everybody's interest to aim at more cooperation and knowing that um, if somebody wins, sometimes the other person loses and you don't want that person to lose. You don't want that country to lose that much. So an energy policy is a case in point. In the European Union, we have to think hard what kind of energy policy we want because it's going to shape the future and it's going to shape the future of the rest of the world as well. So uh, we should not lose the, the global sort of view. Finally, Andre, your um, From a banking standpoint, what I would say is that banks finance the real economy and uh, so we're, we're an integral part of the solution. And I think we, working with, uh, closely with the ECAs in, in partnership, which goes uh, along the lines of what Sylvia was describing as well, uh, collaboration and making sure that uh, we have common objectives. And I mentioned as an example, the ICC white paper on sustainability, but we, I didn't have a chance to talk about the OECD arrangement and some of the challenges, we ran out of time, but this is something I would have liked to, to address as well, because that, I think that's also a context where there are some initiatives that are being taken which could be very positive, but there are some that should be also looked at from the point of view of banks, which could be challenging for banks. And so these are the kinds of things that uh, we, we have to think about and work on together. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the biggest threat I see is, is regulation. Um, the, I mentioned the taxonomy, but there's another uh, element that is hanging on the banks. It's called the non-performing loans uh, treatment uh, by the, uh, uh, the European Commission. Today, it's very penalizing for banks to provide loans uh, long term because you have that potential uh, arbitrary decision made by the EU to impose a uh, a full provisioning of the loans after seven years after default. So even if the ECA is paying an installment, uh, we have to provision the, the amount left over uh, after seven years, which makes no sense whatsoever. So we're trying you know, very hard with the ECAs and with the, uh, the European Commission to try and uh, change that. But regulation is making it very difficult to operate in a, in a, and, and help uh, this uh, uh, this, this uh, effort that we have to increase tenors, which is something that, that's being discussed within the OECD. So uh, they, they, they must be, uh, they cannot be conflicting, they have to be um, complementary. Um, in terms of uh, uh, positives, I think uh, uh, the energy transition is going to give us the opportunity to work with new clients. 
I think new technologies are coming up and that's going to give us uh, uh, new opportunities to explore new new technologies as well as new clients that are coming into this uh, this space. So that's quite exciting as well. Yes, um, I agree with you that we have a problem with regulation. Uh, I think um, all the banks that are here today, your own bank, um, ECAs, we've been working with you in trying to find means to solve this problem if it's not solved at the source, if the regulation is not changed, we are willing to work together with the banks and along with other ECAs in finding solutions that do away with this problem or, or, or actually put an end to it at the seventh year. And, um, and, and I think that our industry is an industry, especially within Europe, that will cooperate, has always cooperated, will cooperate more. Uh, we've seen initiatives from the EU. Uh, we've seen, I think for the first time, the EU taking a very firm stand about the importance of export grade support in promoting European trade. There are some centralized initiatives being um, developed as of today. And, and I think we're going to see changes, especially if the other blocks also continue and, and progress in, in their America first, China first uh, policies. So I, I think the European uh, Commission, the European Council are aware that the, the export support system is very fragmented. It needs to be um, harmonized, but not by an imposition of regulation, not, not by an imposition of more obstacles, but by a firm support, central support from the EU uh, to, to the different institutions that are working in this sphere. Yeah, so I mean, if I may just add, I mean, one thing that is real here is that uh, the, the Europeans are much more penalized and there's no level playing field with the rest of the world. I mean, there's no taxonomy in, in the US, there's no taxonomy in, uh, in, in uh, Asia. Um, this, this, uh, this element that I mentioned, the non-performing loans, applies only to European banks. It does not apply to other banks. So we have that, that uh, you know, we're, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, basically. And, and I think we need to clean up this and yeah. have a better working environment for all. Well, of there's a historical opportunity right now because this analysis of how the system of support for export grades is working in the EU is being taken, it, it, it's being uh, undertaken right now. And so I'm hoping I'm optimistic about this process and we'll see in the next few months if it comes to something that actually help us as opposed to put more sticks in the wheels. So I think with this, uh, we will conclude our second panel. Um, Thank you so much, Mikal, Silvia, Andre, for having agreed to being a part of our birthday, our 50th birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> and, um, and thank you so much for your contributions and continuous support in, in our day today. Um, I see our minister, Reyes Maroto, is here. She is going to be kind enough to close our, our conference today. Um, bienvenida, Ministra. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Um, I, I think we will return to our seats and, and let you take the stand. Muchas, muchas gracias a todos.